Greetings, everybody. So a few days ago, I asked for your images and holy cow, I got a whole bunch of them. I think we had like 300 submissions at least. I know my email inbox is very full and that we're, we're it's really full of a whole bunch of great images. We had a, a really wide variety of images submitted. Some are images that, you know, are e fairly easy to to add critiques to. Some are images that are above and beyond anything that I'm capable of. So those are very difficult for me to critique, as you might imagine. But that's the fun part of this is that it, it doesn't matter whether it's your image that you're looking at. It is still a really useful um exercise to work on your critical eye because our critical eye is really imperative to being able to work towards improving as a photographer or as an artist because unless you can pick apart and critique the things that you wish were a little bit better you won't really know what to work on next time either out in the field for composition or in post-processing so these these sessions help me just as much as it helps hopefully helps you guys so let's sit down together, critique some images together and see if you guys agree with some of the things that I see, because just because I say it does not mean it's right. It's just one photographer's opinion. So let's sit down, critique some images and work on our critical eye. Okay. This first image is from David. What a beautiful location and scene. I really love, obviously, the castle that we have in the background, have this nice water flow, and I love where you chose to shoot this image from. You went over onto the, onto the edge of the rocks here where you were able to incorporate some water flow as a foreground, and as a result, I really like this vertical composition that you chose. Um, not to mention the conditions of the storm clouds above. There's so much good in this image. I think if I was to critique this, the, the very first thing that jumps out at me is that kind of magenta color cast we have going on. Now, sometimes that color cast can really help with the, the feeling and the mood of an image. In this case, I'm not sure that it really helps because, first of all, it's a fairly strong color cast we have, and you can really, you know, it's very noticeable in all of these neutral whites or what should be neutral whites. And I don't think that the magenta really helps the stormy feel of this. So let me show you a quick and easy way to like when you're at this stage in an edit, a quick way to neutralize some of those um, color casts that you might have. If you just go and create a new curves adjustment layer inside of Photoshop and then on the curves adjustment layer, we have this auto button. If I hold down alt or option on a Mac and click on that, we're going to get these different algorithms here that we can choose from. One of them is enhance per color or per channel contrast. And when we do that, it essentially looks at the image and tries to neutralize it. We can also neutralize the midtones, which will neutralize it further. So when we do that, you can see that it, it removes some of that magenta cast that we had. We can hit OK. And obviously, this is really neutralizing it. And I think that's probably too much. But then you can back off the opacity of this layer a bit. It does a really good job of neutralizing that color cast. So we could bring down the opacity all the way and then sneak it up until we get to a point where we still have the a little bit of that mood that you were going for with that magenta cast but it's a lot more neutral. And I think in these kind of stormy sky images, neutral is a good choice because we have lots of textures and lots of contrast in the scene to kind of draw the eye and to add interest. We don't need lots of color as well. Sometimes the color distracts from that contrast. So me personally, I really like in this scene kind of less color just so the eye is more drawn to all the texture in the sky and all of the contrast. So this next image is from Mike. So if we go full screen here, I would ask, what is this image about? And it's obviously to me, it's about our beautiful forest. We've got some fall color in that foliage. We have really interesting, uh, you know, rock formations down here with these reds, but one third of our, our image is being taken up by the sky. And I think the sky is definitely not the main subject, yet it's taking up a third of the frame. I think this is one of those areas where the rule of thirds kind of steers us, 
steers us wrongly compositionally because the, this image really doesn't need that much sky. So the very first thing that I would suggest is just to crop out some of that sky, lose almost half of it. It tells the viewer that the important stuff is down below because obviously real estate kind of is one of the ways of, of directing the eye of the viewer, telling the viewer what is important to, to the image. And the more real estate that is taken up by something, the more important it must be. And in this case, that's really just not true. So in this particular case, I would suggest cr losing some of that sky. That way the viewer's eye is drawn down below. I would even be tempted to, you know, crop out a lot of the sky and maybe just zoom in on little vignettes of the scene and to lose that sky altogether. And what happens then is that we lose that the the brightness of that sky, which serves as an eye magnet because the eye is always going to be drawn to those brightest highlights. And by losing that sky, suddenly the brightest highlights become the highlights in the foliage, some of this fall color, and it ends up perhaps being a bit more of a successful image simply because the eye is drawn directly to the main subject of the image, which is fall color, texture, foliage, stuff like that. So those are, those would be my thoughts. It's still a very beautiful overlook. So this next image is brought in by, I think you pronounce it Luge, L-U-E-J. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of that. Um, but he submitted several really beautiful images, but I wanted to focus on this particular waterfall scene. So really love the amount of effort that has gone into the visual flow. You can see that, you know, he hasn't lifted the shadows a whole bunch. The shadows are nice and deep and dark and mysterious, yet there is some really nice highlight. There's some really nice dodging and burning that he's done on top of these rocks and on the, on the uh, waterfall as well as the log. And then we have this brightness in the background. Really like the visual flow and the dodging and burning that's going on in this image. It has a really nice color and tone in it as well. The, the only thing that I would recommend is you notice these highlights up in these trees. This is what happens when you try to recover highlights that are just gone, they're not there. And you don't want them to be bright and distracting, so when you try to recover them, you end up getting something like this where you see the chromatic aberration around the edges and you end up with these kind of gray spots. A really easy way of, of just fixing that is if we go over to our layers tab here, and let's just go ahead and create a copy of our background layer. We can grab a clone stamp tool. And then with the blend mode of this clone stamp tool set to darken, we can sample with a small brush some from somewhere fairly bright. So over here in this bright foliage. And then clone it in over here in these gaps. And what it's going to do is it's essentially going to fill those gaps with bright foliage. So it's kind of like back behind these dark trees, there's some brighter leaves rather than bright sky. And it ends up being far less distracting and far more natural looking than having those highlights that have been recovered, even though they really couldn't be recovered. So something just as simple as getting rid of these blown highlights over in this area if we go before, after, before, after, it's a much more natural look and it's not going to direct the eye quite as much. I'd also caution against these really, really bright highlights. Maybe if we just recovered those a little bit, the way that I would do it being a luminosity mask user is I would just go, I would grab probably a lights two or even a lights three and then just a little brightness contrast adjustment layer attached to that and just recover those highlights just a little bit. That way this luminosity mask is only going to affect those brightest highlights up there. And just by recovering them a little bit, it kind of eases the tension because when uh, the viewer sees something really bright like that, it almost creates tension because it's white and it's blown out and it's serving like an eye magnet. You know, the eye is always going to be drawn to those brightest highlights, and we don't necessarily want the brightest highlights to be right on the edge of the frame. You could also go in and maybe just to kind of help draw a little bit more attention to this, the center section of the waterfall, 
just create a levels adjustment and just brighten the center bit just the tiniest bit more. So in these two adjustments, if I turn them off and on before, you can see the brightest highlights up here, a little bit darker down here. After we've recovered those highlights and drawn a little bit more attention to the center of the photo, it's just this tiny little thing, but I think it makes a difference. Next image is from Jason. So really cool, moody, black and white. I believe he said this was on Lake Superior. If we go full screen here and zoom in a bit, you can see that there's ice on all these rocks. And I really like the long, long exposure choice here because you end up with, you know, this, the theme of this image is a sharp to soft contrast. You have the soft water and then the, the hard, you know, textured rocks and ice. So a sharp to soft contrast. I really like that. I think that visually there's kind of detail everywhere. You know, there's been some contrast and maybe some clarity added. And as a result, the eye kind of bounces around because there's even, there's even texture and even contrast everywhere. So what I would recommend is maybe to mellow out some of the highlight contrast that's happening in the bottom corners. That way the eye wants to naturally go back to our island back here. Because obviously the reason you shot this location is because of this really cool island that has all this snow and ice on it and is out in the water. Um, I think this is our main subject for the image, yet the eye spends a lot of time bouncing around on the textures down in the bottom portion of this photo. So simply just by mellowing out some of this contrast and allowing the majority of the textured contrast to be on this background island, I think would, would help the scene a little bit. One of the things that I always recommend is that if you're going to do a long exposure, do a long exposure. So this is, I'm guessing this is probably a 30 second exposure. You can tell because it's a long exposure. We have the nice kind of foggy look between the rocks, but there's still quite a bit of texture in this water. And I think in this case, because we have that, you know, sharp to soft contrast theme going where we have sharp ice, sharp rocks, soft water, I would like to see this as more like a two minute long exposure. The reason for that is it's going to turn all that water to like just fog or glass and it's going to have even less texture than it already does. And that's going to make the, you know, things like this, like this background island and all those textures, it's going to make them stand out all the more because it's this kind of island of, of texture. I think that that would maybe help, help the scene a little bit. Also, when you're going black and white, black and whites are all about contrast. And sometimes when we add that amount of contrast to a scene that has dark shadows, we go so far as to lose, lose our shadow information. So for things to feel three dimensional, things close to camera should, uh, sh the shadows close to camera should go closer to black than the things farther away from camera because things further away from camera have atmosphere and, and mist and particulates in the air between us and it. So in order to maintain that sense of depth, these background shadows shouldn't go quite as far or quite as close to black as they currently are. So those would be my recommendations. I love the black and white choice. I think it would have been really cool to just turn this island into kind of a, you know, if you shot this from a slightly different perspective, maybe. That way you don't have all of this foreground information for the viewer to look at and you just create this like super, super minimal almost island out in the middle of this water with, with far fewer rocks in the foreground. I think it would, it would make for a simpler image for the eye to look at because this is a pretty complex image for the eye to look at and it would be a little bit simpler if there was just less in it. So that, that would be my recommendations, but really cool image and props to you for being out there when it must have been incredibly cold. So these next images are from another Mike. This is Mike from Spain, and he sent four really, really good images that I wanted to share with you guys. So the first one is this Star Trails image. Uh, really beautiful tones. I really love the kind of soft blue. You have the nice color contrast between the warmth 
and the coldness, which really makes it work. And none of the, none of the tones are, um, are too strong, I guess. This next image has absolutely beautiful atmosphere. This is a great example of what I was talking about, how things close to camera, you know, the shadows close to camera reach closer to black than the background. And that's what gives it this wonderful sense of, of depth. There's great depth in this scene, not to mention just beautiful conditions, really cool background. I really like the vertical choice here. This image, beautiful contrast. Again, beautiful conditions. I love the wave. I love the light going on in the background here. Um, I do have a few thoughts on this one. And then he also sent in this one. So I think there's, there's stuff to kind of be learned in each of these. For example, this one is an absolutely beautiful scene. I really like the vertical, the vertical choice here. Now on this one, Again, we have a bit of a color con, a color cast, that magenta color cast. I love the color cast in the background and in the sky, but I think that our foreground has a bit more than we need. So something that we could do is let's do that same trick where we bring up a curves adjustment layer, hold down alter option, click on auto, and then go up to enhance per channel contrast. And you can see it really gets rid of the color cast here. I don't like the, the effect that it has on the sky, but I do like the effect that it's having in some of the shadow areas, especially close to camera. So let's hit OK there. Turn it off and on. You can see how it's really cutting through that color, co color cast. So now what we can do is let's just make this a gradient to where it kind of fades out as it gets closer to that background. So I'm going to grab the gradient tool. And then drag down here and we'll just have, if we look at my layer mask, you can see what it's doing. It's making it to where the rocks close to camera have less of that color cast than back there. And then if we want to kind of fade this in together, we could just double click on our layer mask and then slide down the density slider. That way it allows some of that color cast reduction to go into our background just a little bit. So if I hold down alt and click on our layer mask, as I slide this density slider around, you can see what it's doing is it's just not allowing the black parts of this layer mask to go all the way to black. So something like that is going to allow this adjustment to go a little bit into the sky, but it's very much going into our foreground. So just kind of neutralizing that color cast would be my recommendation for this one. So in this one, I feel like, and I do like this foreground wave. I think it's really cool, but I don't know how much all of this sky adds to the shot. To me, all of the action is very much in the center portion of this frame. Granted, you know, it's a moment in time. You can't go back and reshoot that wave, but I'm guessing there was a few waves that day because those are big, beautiful curlers. I would have been interested to know if you shot anything a bit more like this. So obviously this is not ideal when you don't have all of the pixels to play with, but if you would have shot any compositions a bit more like this where you know, you're filling the frame with the action rather than having all of that sky that is not really the point of the frame. The more you can fill the frame with the action, the more impactful that scene's going to be, I think. The more impactful it's going to be in the viewer as opposed to this, where we have a lot of real estate being taken up by, granted they are beautiful storm clouds, but this stuff here is really, really what it's all about, in my opinion. And then in this image, again, we have that color cast. And if we neutralize the color cast, create a curves adjustment layer, hold down alter option, click on auto. When we remove this color cast, you can see this is probably more like what it looked like. And I'm not suggesting that we do this because we lose the feeling of the image. But what we can do is let's work more of this into the shadow areas. So if we just go and we create, let's say a darks to luminosity mask, and restrict this, this neutralization just to the deepest shadows. That way the shadows are a little bit colder and we'll apply that as a layer mask. You can see that it helps a little bit. Let's tone it down a bit, decrease the density of it a bit, just so we can kind of neutralize that color cast just a little because 
color casts are nice. They add a feeling, but if, if they're too strong, the viewer just looks at it and is like, that's purple. <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful image. Just, just neutralizing some of that color cast. I think that way you have a variance of color because in this, in this particular rendition of the image, everything is a different shade of red or magenta. But if we can get a little bit of color separation and also have some bluer tones or some, you know, some more neutral tones in there, it'll make the, the red tones stand out a bit more and feel a little bit more special because it's not just a wash of those magentas and reds. So these next images are from Alberto, also from Spain, I believe. And holy cow, he submitted some really beautiful images. This first one, what I love about it so much is simply the symmetry and the simplicity. He went cold with the color with the color temperature and it really works because it conveys that cold feeling, but he didn't go super saturated or super cold. The snow still feels fairly neutral, which is kind of hard to do in a, in a snow scene. Uh, it feels very neutral, but because of the storminess and the, the amount of cold tones in the sky, it still conveys that beautiful, that beautiful cold feeling. One thing I would recommend though is the vignette that you used is a little bit obvious. So maybe just backing off on that, that vignette that you're using and maybe just creating kind of a dark gradient in the sky instead to bring the eye down, I think would work a little bit better because you can kind of see right here, especially if we zoom out, it makes that vignette pretty obvious. So always view your images kind of as a small thumbnail. It's not always obvious when you're viewing at full screen, but when you zoom it, zoom it out and look at a small thumbnail, it's a little things like that become a little bit more apparent. And sometimes you can create a very similar effect just by kind of darkening through a contrast layer and then just creating a gradient in the sky before, after, just to get that same effect, only not do it quite so much in the corners. So this next image here, again, really beautiful. I like that it's got this nice, strong um, color temperature choice, right? But we still have variation in the, the tones that are present. So it's not just a wash of red and orange. We have blue tones and warm tones present. And that's what makes it work. When you have that nice color separation, color contrast, it makes, it makes that, color that, that color temperature work. If everything is just a wash of one color, that's what tells you that you kind of need to in introduce um, or neutralize that color cast a little bit. That way you have that, that color contrast, that color separation is really important. Um, one thing I would recommend though, is to maybe just ease off the con contrast in this background and these deepest shadows, just cause you don't want to lose information. Things are not going all the way to black and it's totally a personal choice thing but I would like to see into those shadows just the tiniest bit more, but really good job dealing with the dynamic range of this scene. Um, really, really beautiful. And I love the falling snow as well. Absolutely gorgeous scene. And then this one absolutely love the amount of movement and the shutter speed choice. If we zoom in here, look at all this texture in this water. We even have a bubble, but like the sharpness and the, um, the sharpening that you've done and the shutter speed choice look absolutely awesome in the water. But one thing I would caution you about is like, this has been sharpened pretty heavily and you can see that looks pretty good in some of the rock areas, but what you got to watch out for is stuff like this. So I'm guessing this halo here was most likely created from the sharpening that was applied. A lot of times you'll get this sh over sharpening halo. And a quick way of dealing with that is we can create a copy of this background layer, grab our clone stamp tool, set the mode to darken again, and let's go like 70% opacity. And all you do is you zoom in and you hold down alt and sample from a portion of the sky close to where you're going to try to fix the halo. And then you just go over the top of the halo and you'll have to go a couple times here. So we'll do it a second time. And that essentially you're just cloning over that halo with some sky and it really helps get rid of that halo. So one of the things you got to watch out for anytime you're sharpening heavily is 
sharpening halos. They are the devil, Bobby Boucher. You got to be careful with those. But this is a really easy, quick trick to get rid of over sharpening halos, or maybe it's halos created by exposure blending that what didn't go quite to plan. Um, this is an easy way of getting rid of that. So before, after, not too bad. So really like the sharpening in this water, maybe a touch overdone, but it's really, really cool. It's really impactful. So really beautiful here. Also watch your highlights over in this portion of the frame. Maybe if you're doing a little bit of dodging where you in introduced some of that color, maybe just back off a little bit, maybe add a little bit of um, negative dehaze to kind of mellow that portion out. That way the eye doesn't get drawn to this corner as much as it's going to get drawn to this beautiful texture in the water. All right, guys. So really good images. I mean, I'm only scratching the surface of what was submitted. There's a whole bunch more images to go through. And I think we should do one of these a week. You guys let me know if this is useful and interesting to you. I know it helps me just to go through this process because every time I, I use my critical eye, I get better because that critical eye is going to get used on my own photography. The next time I sit down to process the ability to kind of look at an image and, and analyze what it is that it bothers you or, or could be better. It makes us better. So developing your critical eye is a critical part of getting better as a photographer. I hope that you guys are all well. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Hopefully some of this was useful and we'll catch you next time. Take it easy, everybody.